So it's actually a bit of a bonus edition. Uh, typically, we run these once a quarter, uh, but we did have a conversation back in the previous user group uh, on February 21st, actually one month ago uh, from today, and uh, the discussion went on for quite a long time. So we've actually broken this now into a second part. So welcome to the user group. All right, just a couple of virtual reminders here. So this meeting will be recorded and is posted to the Iteration Insights YouTube channel, uh, as well as the Power BI Tips YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitch, Facebook, and Twitter accounts. Uh, so plenty of different places where you can go and get this uh, after the fact. Uh, if you do do any speaking, make sure you mute yourself uh, for better sound quality. Uh, and we will be monitoring the chat for any questions that come up over the course of the uh, discussion here. All right, so the agenda for today. So these are all in Mountain Standard Time. Uh, is that at three o'clock uh, right now, we'll be doing our meeting welcome and introduction, just walking through some of the things about the user group. Uh, 305 to 310, we'll just do a bit of a recap on the previous user group where we talked about uh, enterprise skills for Power BI and some myths uh, that surround Power BI that uh, we want to work to dispel. Uh, and then at 310, we'll get into the part two section of the discussion of skills for enterprise Power BI. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up with uh, about 10, 15 minutes, depending on how many questions we have uh, of Q&A and wrap ourselves up for the day. All right, so a number of places that you can uh, find the user group is within the Microsoft uh, community. There is the Calgary Power Platform user group. Uh, you can scan the QR code over on the left. Uh, and that will take you to the Power Platform uh, page within Microsoft itself. Uh, we do run ourselves a Facebook group as well, and the QR code for that is uh, also in the bottom left-hand side of the screen there. Uh, if you want to go ahead and join this group uh, for being notified of uh, upcoming topics. Uh, the next user group meetings, the next scheduled ones, are May 23rd, and we're working on some special guests for May 23rd that we typically have to try and bring in once a year or every uh, every now and again. And then September 12th is the first one after fall because uh, we do break for the Calgary uh, user group over the summertime. Uh, and then just as a little reminder as well, in case uh, you are new to this group, uh, is that we also run a Calgary Azure Analytics user group meeting uh, on June 6th and September 26th, uh, following the normal quarterly cadence. And in that one, we talk about any of the products in the Microsoft suite uh, of Azure products that are around data. So kind of fun to draw the lines around what those products exactly are. You know, the big ones are uh, Synapse, Data Lake, uh, and, and products like that within the, within the Azure fold. But uh, we're talking about that. And June 6th, we're trying to line our topics up around that to be around Azure Synapse, uh, and in particular, the things that kind of relate more to the data side in terms of catalog uh, and lineage. So we're pretty excited about some of the things we're starting to see happening in the Synapse side of the world. Uh, and then September 26th will be the fall session when we reconvene notes. All right, so you just uh, uh, stay tuned for those coming up. Uh, if you do want to speak at any of our user group meetings, we always encourage those that want the platform or the stage to go ahead and uh, contact Maria there. So Maria's emails in the uh, slide deck there. And you can uh, go ahead and uh, present any of the topics that you may want. And like I say, we're always looking for people that are wanting to get up on the stage here. All right, so uh, skills for enterprise Power BI part two. As I, as I mentioned back on February 21st, uh, Mike, Carlo and myself uh, had this presentation that we were going through. Uh, we had it all uh, done up. We thought it was about one hour's worth of material, but it turns out we only got halfway through uh, in that one hour, just really kind of showing how big the topic uh, actually is. So what we've done is taken the other half of that presentation and broken it into, uh, into a part two. So uh, Mike, do you wanna come on and introduce yourself? Hello, um, Mike, I'm back again. So uh, hello and welcome back to our next discussion around Enterprise Power BI. This is a an ever increasing topic and I find that I'm talking more and more about what this looks like for organizations, small and, and large organizations at that level anyways. So yeah, this is a great topic and I think this is, uh, the fact that we need a part two is very indicative of the topic itself. There's a lot to think about uh, and it encompasses more than just the technology. It's people and process that are also very much engaged with what this looks like. And so just being able to wrap your head around, how does this new Power BI tech tool fit a data culture? How does it fit our organization? Where do we need to manage and what do we need to manage moving forward? So I think this is a great topic. Awesome, I'm very much uh, very much looking forward to it. So 
Uh, let's just go through really quick and uh, recap some of the myths that we discussed last time. I'm going to spend about five minutes doing this. Uh, if you want to go into more depth, the recording is available on all the social channels that we mentioned earlier. Uh, so that is available. Uh, myth number one uh, is that we kind of see, uh, and, and Mike and I are reflecting on this, a lot of organizations, a lot of people uh, view Power BI as just a reporting tool. So there's a lot of, uh, for lack of a better term, baggage that comes along with that, or uh, maybe you know, organizations not quite fully understanding everything that goes into Power BI and the skills that are needed and the supporting structures that are needed to make it work. Uh, and that, you know, a lot of times is a byproduct of the fact that, you know, some just view it uh, as a reporting tool. So some of the things we're going to talk about a little bit later on uh, are kind of tools that we've been using uh, a lot last little while to kind of, uh, you know, show how big Power BI is and how to kind of frame the learning uh, and what the journey would look like. And then some of the supporting pieces uh, to become competent uh, as an organization. And as Mike alluded to a moment ago here, uh, a lot of it doesn't really have to do with the technology itself uh, in this, uh, in some of the topics we're going to talk about here. It's just more raising awareness of the things that you do need to know. So exposing perhaps some of the technical things that you do need to be new to need to become proficient at uh, yeah. as an organization. On, on our podcast, we talk about this topic a lot. We talk a lot about it's the people, it's the process, and the technology. Those are the kind of the key elements that are bringing that together. And you have to think about all those elements that are all drawn in when you start talking about Power BI. Perfect. So myth number two, uh, I can just move uh, from Excel into Power BI uh, and be off to the races. So this one kind of is a bit of a follow on or from the myth number one, where Power BI is viewed as just a reporting tool. And kind of how we triangle it in this one is if you're coming from an Excel world and you've got those, you know, one, two, five, 10, 20 years worth of design patterns that you've built up as an Excel user, uh, to move over into Power BI and use it proficiently, there is some unlearning uh, of what you've done over the years uh, inside of Excel. And, you know, sometimes old habits die hard. So uh, trying to, you know, one of the things we really work on is making sure that we unlearn some of those things, or at least teach the people that are trying to move over into Excel how to unlearn some of those things so they do things well with inside of Power BI and just don't take what they've been doing in Excel over into Power BI, which can start creating some uh, some problems. Did you want to say anything, add anything more to that one, Mike? No, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I am gotta be honest, I love Excel. That's where I came from. So Excel is my baby. <laughs> so I, I would say uh, I made a lot of my career about doing really good things inside Excel. So I'm not gonna, in no way are you saying throw out Excel only use Power BI. It's a complimentary tool. So you know, the, the, only, the only other addition there would be is uh, it's it's an and feature. And when we really think about what's happening, it's the concept of Power BI and a data model, Excel and a data model, paginating reports and a data model. The data model is becoming so critical to what we're doing. And that's that's the technology that really enables a lot of this. Yeah, and I think that's it's really important to kind of you know, say it the way that you you said it there, Mike, because I find it diffuses a lot of tensions sometimes around, you know, Power BI and Excel. When you get a user that thinks that now I've got to walk away from Excel and do everything only in Power BI and Excel is going away and you've tried for years to take it away from me. Uh, yep. That's not the case. So kind of nope. by saying what you're saying there, it kind of diffuses the situation and say, yes. you learn both, learn how to use what, both together. Yes. Still going nowhere. We, we both know that. Yes. Uh, Using them well together is a is a great uh, place to be. All right, myth number three, really quickly. I can learn Power BI by watching a patchwork of YouTube videos and blogs. So uh, this one's always kind of a you know an, an interesting topic. Is is don't get me wrong, uh, Excel or sorry, uh, blogs and YouTube videos are fantastic ways to learn things, as long as you've got the foundation on how the tool actually fits together from a front to back perspective. It's not to say you need to spend years doing what I just said there, and understanding the, the basics of you know, your sources, think how to do things well in Power Query, how to model your data well, how to you know, you get your data model set up for self-service, some of the basics around DAX, some of the basics around reporting, and then distribution on the service side. If you understand front to back at a high level how they all fit together, yep. uh, then you can go ahead and use those videos in YouTube uh, uh, YouTube videos and blogs to go and enhance that learning. And I use them all the time. In fact, I was teaching a finance audience last week and I actually came up with a new way to articulate to the STEM. I said, 
you know, in a lot of ways, if you want to become proficient in finance, you need to understand how all of the statements work together. So when I change something on the balance sheet or do something in the income statement, how does that flow through to all the statements? And if you understand and appreciate how that all comes together, then you're going to, you know, generally start understanding accounting better. Uh, and same goes with Power BI. If you understand at a very high level how things work yep. and how it knits together, you are going to become much more proficient and then be able to take things to the next level. Agree. Love it. Great analogy, by the way. Yeah, I, did. I came up with it on the fly the other day. I don't know how I did it, but uh, that's usually how it works. Uh, all right. So Power BI does not require IT involvement. Uh, the history of this one's rather interesting. You know, back when I got involved in release number one of this current incarnation of Power BI back in July of 2015, uh, you know, it was really kind of a purely business only tool that was kind of viewed to be a lot like Excel. And, you know, high level, most IT departments looked at the product and said, ah, there's nothing in it for me. It's just another Excel for the business users. So that has kind of carried forward a little bit. But over the years, you know, fast forward all the way to 2023, there are some incredibly technical things you can do inside of Power BI. Uh, but you still get the simplicity as a business user of keeping the tool nice and simple from your perspective. Uh, but there are a lot of really interesting things you can do from the technical side to take Power BI to the next level. And I know. Mike, you were at the SQL Bits last week uh, over in London, and there's some pretty cool announcements that are that are coming out. Incredible uh, announcements, announcements. Okay. yeah. But one of the major ones that I'm super excited about is the, uh, they, they call it the Timdle. There's a new, Microsoft announced a brand new language around how you can interact with the data models and building models themselves, which is huge. Uh, but this also provides a very close integration with IT. And so when we're trying to build a pipeline of regularly deployable reports and data sets, this language is an incredible helper to make that easier to read, build from a developer standpoint, but also maintain as a as a team of people who are trying to uh, continually develop great looking reports or great looking data models and so and functional data models at that. So very excited, huge announcement. But again, that fit, that fits very well with here. You can get so far with without IT's involvement, but at some point you'll need to have more involvement from IT whether it's a data source or other things you need information from, uh, but it's better to engage earlier than later. Absolutely. All right, and finally, myth number five before we get into today's uh, uh, materials is Power BI can do it all. Uh, and this is kind of uh, you know a classic thing that mm. we all like to do is when we have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, uh, but understanding you know where the limits of Power BI are and where you need to look at moving into other parts uh, of the Microsoft suite of products, assuming you're, you know, all in on the Microsoft uh, stack, you know, there are times where you do want to look at moving things potentially over uh, into the the Azure side of the world, let a more classic data engineer uh, handle some of those tasks. So just trying to understand where those boundaries are uh, is really important because we see a lot of organizations getting into trouble by trying to make Power BI do it all. Then when we come in, we say, you know, actually that part there, you should be looking to do uh, over in some other part uh, of the Azure stack, you know, whatever the, the, the business problem is. But that's kind of symptomatic of the when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Do you want to add anything there, Mike? Yeah, I'd say this is another classic example of you can do a ton with Power BI. But again, sometimes you're doing proof of concepts or MVPs around that information. And it really does pay to use Matthew Roach's maxim, they call it the Roach's maxim, which is transform the data transform the data as far upstream as possible and as far downstream as necessary. So you do get to a point where the data gets larger, there's more information, we, we have more, you do need a data warehouse. Power BI, I've seen someone on LinkedIn broadcasting, well, I made a data warehouse in Power BI. Yes, you could do that, but I would not recommend it. So there, there, there is a time and a place for where Power BI sits and, and looking at the lens of that in comparison to where enterprise proper enterprise warehousing looks like granted the tools are changing the technology is getting better we're talking about lake houses a whole lot more than we ever had before but realistically those heavier transformations are more involved with the organization and they are further upstream so many of my now enterprise reports don't do any power query transformations everything's done upstream so i think the further you get towards an enterprise solution you you actually see the tool being utilized slightly different as you go towards that enterprise involvement. Perfect. All right. So today's material. So uh, 
pillars of a well-designed organization from you know, a Power BI and analyst perspective. Maybe I should kind of clarify it with that uh, uh, around some of the boundaries. So the, the first thing that we really want to see organizations do and think about is, you know, it kind of goes back to your people process uh, technology, Mike, because sometimes everyone wants to jump into technology immediately without thinking about who's actually using these tools and how are they interacting with them. So effectively, what role uh, are you playing? So we we'll always try to work with organizations and say, let, let's make sure we understand who the people are that interact with the tool and what do they actually need to know? So this is uh, an adapted uh, piece of a, a blog from the Eckerson group called Know Thy Customer. So when you're you know, getting into analytics, it's very important to know who you're working with, right? So no different than anything out in the, the consumer or the business world is know who your, your customers are and how you can best serve them. And what are the limitations? What do they want to see? So what are, what are their demands? So you know, we kind of like to frame this uh, as that in any organization, so to, and uh, you know, take an organization, let's say around a thousand people, roughly 60% of those organizations or 60% of the people in that organization are what we would call a consumer. So they're not really interested in building anything inside of Power BI but they want to consume things. They may do some light interactions. So a classic consumer, just hand me something, I'll read it, interpret it, maybe interact with it a little bit, uh, and that's it. So call that about 6%. And I'm sure you could probably debate the numbers in some orgs, it may be a little higher, some a little yeah. lower. But from a framework perspective, that's kind of where most people sit. Uh, kind of what we like to say around that type of user, because a lot of organizations ask, hey, can you... Can you develop some training for that user group? And my answer to that is no. Uh, typically, the how you get trained on how to interact with Power BI is whoever built that application should go off and show those users how to actually use what was built. And every now and again, I get somebody saying to me, you know, if, if you have to train people on how to do this, you've made it too complex. Uh, I don't believe that at all. I kind of believe that anything you do from a technical perspective should come with some form or fashion of training or a guide on how to use things because not everybody's coming from the same place. And sometimes mm -hmm. that is more technical people making those statements because they can kind of figure things out on their own and they're more willing to experiment and play around. But if totally. you really want users to succeed, you need to give them this training because we have to always remember that uh, a lot of users coming into Power BI are coming from the Excel pivot table world. Just give me a table. I want to print out. So that's their world. And now we're trying to take them on this journey to a, a more interactive way to you know, interact with their data in a more connected way of doing it with more sources, drill up, drill down, hierarchies and drill throughs and things like that. I love all that stuff. I think it's fantastic. For a lot of the users that are consuming Power BI, that's new to them and they don't want to see it. So the statement they always make is, how can I export that to Excel? So whenever users say that, that I always like to tell people, that's your opportunity as somebody in Power BI to show that user how to do things properly, keep them contained inside of the Power BI world so it can stay governed. And that's something we'll talk about a little bit later on. So did you want to add anything on that uh, point there, Mike? No, I think this is actually very on point. I, the, I mean, my, my only counter note here would be is, think about Excel. How long has Excel been around? 30, 30, 40 years at this point. I mean, it's been around forever, right? And now the people are just, I mean, and how long have pivot tables been around? 10 years, maybe more, right? If okay. you look at that, how long has it taken for people to now just start realizing pivot tables are really cool, like very, very useful. So even now today, I, I mean, tables have been in Excel for a while as, as well. People don't use these features all the time. So again, it, there's, it's the idea of, of alluding to there's a better way, right? There, there's another way that you can do these things. And to, to just assume people can, is to get into a report and, build, and understand what it is, you really are making a data application. And if you think of it that way, you would never produce some sort of app in the real world without any sort of help or um, ability to let people understand what it's building, being, how do you use it, right? So the same thing, we should take the same stance on our data as well. Absolutely. So I like it a lot. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. So then the next level up is kind of what is referred to by the Eckerson Group as the data explorers. And that's roughly 30% of the organization. And these are these are users that you know will use, I guess, in the Excel world, they would use Excel fairly frequently for doing some reporting, 
you know, a few data sources, doing some light transformations, but Excel plays a role in their analytical daily lives. Uh, and those users, you know, I like to, to believe that those users now should have a base level of understanding of Power BI because then they can learn how to use the two tools together uh, in conjunction with each other. So going back from the points we were saying earlier is how to use the tools effectively together is sometimes a matter of uh, exposing them to how they work together and what the art of the possible is or, you know, over in you know, a tool such as Power BI. So you know, we'll talk about what the level one training looks like here in a little bit, but that's 30% of our organization. So if you think about that from a training perspective in a lot of our larger organizations, that's into the hundreds of users that need to go through some basic training inside of Power BI. Agreed. And, and often a lot of organizations, they don't quite understand that. They've said, hey, here's Power BI. They release it out to the wild and they say, everyone go, here's your pro license and off to the races. And you know what Mike and I were kind of reflecting on uh, at the beginning of this uh, presentation as we we're preparing is we're seeing a surge right now of organizations that are you know kind of looking in behind them saying, what has happened over the last couple of years? Yeah, we this giant mess in behind us. How Agreed. do we prevent this from happening again? Right. And that's and that's the problem with just letting people figure things out. Right. There's a lot of great things on YouTube, but not all of them are aligned with best practices. And just because something works doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to do it. And I think as you as I have learned through Power BI, again, experimentation, trying different things, uh, trying to overcome different challenges. Right. You start forming like, well. I've already tried three different things. I now know what is a better way to do things. And, and so that knowledge, that learned experience, you want to bring that from the experts in your team, right? There's, there, there are going to be Power BI champions in your organization. Bring them to those newer users and have them educate, come alongside, mentor them. Uh, there, there is a, a bit of a learning gap here that this really aids to. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, so when we take this, and uh, the funny thing is this, kind of the deck that we're going through here over the next little bit, uh, is something that probably since November, October of last year, I feel like I've shown to multiple organizations multiple times, and that's causing a lot of people to kind of step back and say, wait a minute, this is bigger than we thought. Oh. Uh, and now it's starting to be, you know, people are taking it a little bit more seriously. So it's a, you know, a convergence of a lot of different things happening right now around the Power BI space that's really driving a lot of interest uh, in this topic. Mm -hmm. I'd agree with that too. I am, I'm seeing the same level of interest, right? Uh, you don't know what you don't know. And there's a lot of people who don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, then the next level up is a, a smaller portion of the organization. So these are, you know, what Dwayne Eckerson refers to as the data analysts. So these are, you know, what we probably in the Excel world call your super user, your power user. They're the ones that just love rolling their sleeves up, doing a lot with Excel, working a lot more with sources, you know, cleaning data up, interpreting, building reporting and things like that. Uh, and that user base, you know, comes over into Power BI and they become kind of the power users uh, around Power BI. And, you know, Mike a minute ago was alluding to the, the people that can help others in the organization, right? So mm -hmm. if you've got skill and somebody's having a problem, well, if yeah. you know how to make those connections between those two people, they can generally help each other out, which is a, yes. which is a fantastic thing. So the organization needs the level one skills, but then they do need the level, the, the next level up, the data analyst, which I've got labeled as level two, three, and four, they need those skills as well because the data explorers at some point in time will need some support and they'll need a community uh, to go and seek help from. Great. And I, and I think this also is a very important, like that this level at this at this part of the organization is really will depend, the, 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 let me say that again, will depend on the department they come from. Some departments have a much larger strength in this area than others. Finance department will be very strong in this area because they're already used to a lot of analytics. They're very comfortable with the data and that they're how to transform it to get the answers they need. Other departments may not be as, as equipped. And so you're going to find that this will vary across the organization. Exactly. And then the final piece here is that, you know, I, like, I always have to have a spot for the data scientists. So you know, Wayne refers to this as being the 2% of most organizations by true definition of a data scientist. And we're not going to get in the true definition of the data scientist here now, uh, I don't think. That's another uh, whole thing together. So it's a whole, it's probably going to be a part three if we really want <laughs> If we keep out. going, yes. Yeah. So, you know, these, these users are generally schooled, they're getting the on-the-job experience. And uh, I kind of like the way that you're kind of describing it in our uh, 
you know, our pre-call prep uh, mic around, you know, how data scientists are actually interacting with Power BI. Yeah. I see data scientists thinking about a data a Power BI, particularly on the front end, on the back end. So um, what I mean by the front end is when a data scientist needs information, they're looking for tables of data that the business has generated or and including the, the measures that you create, right? The, the, the data set has tables that are together and there's a relationship between those data and things. That schema of information is incredibly useful for doing those data science activities later on. So data scientists are interested in getting access to a data model. This is a great way to integrate that with data scientists is given the Power BI REST endpoint API where they can write their own custom DAX against a data model and extract out information that they need. What then typically happens is the tools that data scientists usually use are not necessarily inside Power BI. They're Spark notebooks, it's Spark, it's, it's other types of analytical tools or potentially they even want to do some things that are offline on their own machine using some Python libraries, whatever that may be. Now, I'm going to say Power BI does have these capabilities built into them. They are there. However, what I would say is looking at those capabilities, they're not data science level type tools. It's more of a business user focus. So typically there's a lot more complication there. So then, then the data science will take the data away. Now, the data scientist I see comes back to Power BI after the data science element has been done. We now have a groomed set of table or information, and now we're looking to craft a story around what the data science data is doing. Then the data science re same time just would re-engage with Power BI and say, okay, I'm ready to come back in and develop reports and other visualization things for the story around what the data is. And we actually had an episode on the podcast that talked a lot about um, crafting stories with, with data. And uh, we we're reviewing an article um, where, uh, I don't remember her name uh, at the top of my head, but she was she was communicating about the idea that when her organization stopped focusing on data science and started st focusing on the story of data, that's when they got a lot of movement with data science. It's the story of why this is true. We have to simplify it. We have to get people from where they're at into understand how this data is impacting their, their daily workflow. Yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah, the data scientist. I'm. Oh boy, I said I wasn't going to go there. Maybe I'll go there a little bit. It's funny. I was speaking. Be careful. Be careful, because this could go for a long time now. I was. Uh, I was speaking at a conference on Friday, and I said, you know, it's just amazing, just the, the amount of work that is still there in the descriptive space. Like most organizations yes. are still yes. so far back in just getting the descriptive yep. world sorted out. That. Yep. You know, we'll get there, uh, for sure. But it's not quite as uh, heavy as you see on LinkedIn. If you if you if you had listened to the hype that was data scientists. And, and what they were going to be doing with all this new information, you'd be like, oh my goodness, we're going to be doing predictive everywhere. I mean, I think we're starting to see a, a, a threshold here with chat GPT and AI being integrated, like open AI and now office tools. There's a lot of AI based things that are now being reintroduced back into products because now we're starting to see a level of really useful tools coming out of AI. And so I think you're going to start continually, you're, you're going to continue to see organizations investing in these really heavily used tools and it'll need to be adopted as a common place. It'll have to be everywhere. Yeah, I was kind of, it was uh, speaking at a at that same conference on Friday, and I was saying, you know, I've been around the data space long enough that everything comes full circle. Yeah. Uh, chat GPT is what everybody's talking about right now. So, of course, everyone's going to run around thinking it's the going to solve all their problems. It's going to just create well, another whole round of problems for us to kind of deal yes, with. Data yes, it will. <laughs> yes, yeah. it will. This is, okay. this is another topic we talked in the podcast around the trough of disillusionment, right? So there's yeah. there's the you know the ramp up of like great expectations, and then you hit the peak of like okay we're here, and then there's like this huge trough of disillusionment where everyone's like oh this is junk, what are we doing? Like this throw, and then eventually we kind of settle back into like a place where this this starts making a lot of sense, right? We can actually use it in a functional way, and I think that's where we're at. We're very we're in the hype cycle right now. We're hyping it up like crazy. Yeah, it is certainly being hyped. All right, so back, back to the topic at hand, and my apologies for sorry. You, that was your fault. Oh, you took us. Totally, totally you mine. took us there, and you said you were going to take us there. So that was that was not me. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally me. I do that. I, I'm, I'm it's okay. I understand. Uh, skills matrix. So let let's kind of get into this. So thinking a little bit about the skills that are needed as an organization to use uh, Power BI proficiently. So. Uh, Power BI tips uh, way back in February 2021 feels like a long time ago now. Uh, I'll never eons in the tech space at this yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. Two years ago, almost. I know. It, it's crazy. I'll I'll never forget when you guys put this out, and I looked at it, and I said, finally, uh, we're getting onto paper everything that is kind of 
needed to become proficient in power band think about it from a framework perspective so i love this the story you're kind of telling about the genesis of this uh, mike maybe you want to quickly yeah the, 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 so uh seth bauer and i were working uh, together and we were, we were needing to hire people and um th the challenge becomes well how do you get good quality talent what are the questions we should be asking and so this after doing many many reviews and, and everyone will tell you yes i do power bi yes i do power bi so they, they clear the screening um, very easily, but then we actually asked them to do real things. And so the, there, there came this struggle of, it was very challenging for these interviewers to come to us because they, there's, there is no BSing. <laughs> you, you, could not, you could not pull the wool over our eyes. I mean, being the, the people that have been in the tool since the very beginning, th there is no level of talk that you can say that we can't pick on you to figure out what's really going on. So we, had, we were rigorous. I mean, we were detailed. It was fun, but we, we were very... Uh, strategic with our questions. And so what kind of came out of that was um, Seth really did a lot of work on this trying to think through like, okay, what are the skills that are needed? Where can I evaluate where people are at? And how can I really gauge what your score would be in these different areas? And so the idea here on this you know, skills matrix is to really give you a feel for um, in these various areas, if someone talks about these, these particular topics, we, we can kind of bucket them a little bit. We can have, we can have a scale or a gauge. Uh, and this is the first time that I've seen anywhere on the internet around really talking about a threshold or a bar that people need to jump over in order to get to the next level of things. And so I think this is a great step. A lot of organizations need to use this, um, but that, that's kind of how it was born, right? We, we needed a way to be able to rank people and figure out what, were they really telling us the truth or not? And as a bonus item, for those of you listening, I will highly recommend if you are interviewing people, figure out a way or figure out, have them live demo to you building inside a report. Now, again, it's very hard to let people do a live demo on things, but Power BI Desktop makes it incredibly easy to go get the standard data set from desktop. So ask them to do that. Then ask them to make a measure. Then ask them to make a bar chart. Just doing those very basic things, I get a very clear understanding uh, if you know how to write and create calculations on top of things in Power BI. So just because you've used Power BI doesn't mean you're proficient in it. And just this was one way that we used to measure things. Yeah, I'll never forget. I was, uh, might have been right around this 2021. Maybe it might have even been the year earlier. Anyhow, I was teaching somebody Power BI. And at that time, we had an introduction Power BI course and an intermediate mm. Power BI course. Yeah. And, and I had a few people say, no, no, I, I know Power BI. I want to go into your intermediate class. And I was like, okay, well, if you think you know it, and I never at, went through and asked them any questions and stuff like that, but now, uh, now I do. Yeah. Uh, and we sat down. I said, all right, everyone go ahead and get Power Query Editor open. And they both looked at me and said, what's Power Query Editor? I went, you're not an intermediate user of Power BI. Like, you, <laughs> yes, exactly you, right there. You know how to go there, right? So yes. that kind of when that happened, I thought, all right, we need to come up with a better way to start yes. measuring for this stuff. So it was a kind of an innocuous little thing that happened, but it was enough to make me go, you know what, I think people are overrating their skills in Power BI. And I'll say everyone is, uh, yes. but there's enough out there that it's causing challenges in a lot of organizations, be able to say it politely that way. Yep, yep. Yep, I would agree with that one, 100%. All right, so, you know, just uh, kind of going through what is probably, it looks like an eye chart on the screen here. So you've got your, you know, connect and transform, so go find your data, connect it, clean it, put in your data model, do some data modeling related tasks, as we all know building visualizations, and then having an understanding and appreciation about the administration architecture side of things. Uh, and then the last row is the embedding and, and custom visualization. So I was kind of, you know, you know, uh, we were talking a little while ago, uh, Mike, that at some point I want to kind of go through this again and say, hey, like now that we're in 2023, are there some improvements that can be made to this and maybe suggest some things back over to, uh, to the crew there and see if we can maybe update it a little bit. Not to say it has to be, but it's just kind of worthwhile. You know, two years, a lot happens in two years. Uh, around the product. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I think there's, uh, I'm also working on a lot more things that go beyond the scope of just, I mean, this is, this is looking at connecting, transforming, modeling, visualization, and admin. This is a portion of the things that you can do in powerbi.com. So I think there's actually more um, areas that would be relevant to the skills matrix. This is just a starting point for, there's actually a whole lot more now. Yeah. And at the end of the day, this, you know, 2023, and this was done 2021. This is still light years ahead of where most people even are. So this is still very well, I would agree. So in terms of just kind of, you know, if you just think back to the pyramid that I put up there a little bit earlier, thinking about 
how you can come up with some type of training program as an organization around this because you are probably all working organizations maybe you do have the challenge of trying to raise the skill level uh, of your organization so you know what i like to kind of say is affectionately call people with level zero skills the ones that are just starting with power bi and and most of them that have, have some excel experience or other reporting tool experience can probably go and figure out through watching some YouTube videos or blogs, or maybe just even following help documentation in Power BI itself, mm -hmm. is they can do some level one connecting and transforming data. Uh, probably going to be that single one big table they bring in right out of their Excel spreadsheet. Uh, probably can figure out how to build a couple visualizations on it. They don't really understand the administration architecture side of the world, and there's really nothing happening from a custom biz perspective. So a yep. lot of people are kind of really here when they show up in Power BI and fumble their way through their first visual, uh, whatever they built. I would agree with that one. That sounds very familiar. Again, you, you're basically aware that it exists is basically what you get to. Yeah, that, that's, that's probably a really good way to say it is you're aware of the tools existence and you can do some stuff with it. Yeah. From a level one perspective, like, you know, we kind of look at this and say, here's kind of what a level one user, which going back to our, our pyramid was the data explorer. Uh, they should have these skills right here. So, uh, we're actively working right now around coming up with some self-assessment type questions that we can give to people to go and answer this and score yourself to see where do you fit uh, in this bucket. Are you already a level one user? Are you halfway there? Uh, and just kind of honestly score yourself. So that's some stuff we're working on at the moment because there's been a lot of a lot of ask uh, for items around that space over the last little bit. So you know, I would call this you know your your classic level one uh, user. Do you want to add anything on that, Mike? Yeah, I think I think this is a good place to start. So, you know, this is someone who's been and again, I like to throw time frames on things here as well. When you're talking about level one, right, I kind of know what M is. I'm able to play around with it a little bit. Uh, I, I'm understanding a little bit more what the calculate function is doing. Right? These, these are more advanced concepts. Simple bookmarking is happening. Maybe um, I'm able to react and, and make things move around the page based on bookmarks. Right. All of this to me feels like there's um, a very, you know, that the introduction of this fits to me like from that one to three, maybe six months, depending on how aggressive you are and trying to self-discover things, right? So that's kind of the span of time I would expect certain users to have uh, with this kind of engagement. Yeah, that's, that's good. I like the fact that you put the time horizon on there because uh, that certainly helps uh, the learning, uh, the motivation and learning. And that kind of like, I always like to say to my, my folks is if you, but when it comes to exams or learning something, I always kind of like to use the certification exams. If you don't have an exam booked, you're not really studying for the exam. You're kind of casually reading about it, but yeah, yeah. you book it, you pay for it. Now you're like, oh, yes. I better, I've got a deadline to work to. Yes. You're not kind of really there, right? So I think exactly right. Very important. All right. So kind of what the the rough bucketing of skills around level two, which is kind of your intermediate, uh, the the data analysts on the matrix. So these are kind of roughly some of the skills. Obviously, a little deeper in. You know, connecting and transforming, modeling and visualization. There's a bit of overlap between uh, some of these uh, as well. Uh, but this is kind of what we would expect most uh, intermediate users of Power BI to do on the level two side of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the level three, uh, you know, let's just face it, uh, the videos by the, the Marco and Alberto, they're, you know, in my opinion, the best. Others may have their opinions on things. They've got modeling handled very well and proficiently from a Power BI perspective and on the DAC side. So I just kind of direct people over to those videos saying, hey, when you want to go in the modeling section from six all the way down to 10, there's this wonderful suite of videos out there yep. you, you subscribe to. Yep. Uh, at that point in time, you're comfortable with Power BI. You know how to work your way around it. So you can sit and watch pre-recorded videos. Yes. And yes. be just fine, right? And I think, I think for their videos too, like there's, there is some very good basic things that are very good for fundamentals. Um, and I would I would recommend starting them at, you know, six, right? So they're intros of stuff. Really, you know, just you you know how to use some basic things before this, right? So you know under, you understand what the calculate function is doing, right? That there's really good inter, introduction videos there, but they can go very deep very quickly, really talking about how the model engine works and all the other elements. And if you don't have some fundamental understanding about what they are talking about, you get really lost really fast, and the, the information becomes a lot less effective. So having that that engagement at that lower level here makes a lot of sense. And they do have beginner, intermediate, and advanced. So it definitely scales with this whole area all the way from six to 10. Yeah, it's definitely approached from an engineering perspective, which for the right audience is fantastic. But if you're yes. a new business user trying to get into Power BI, it can be a bit of a challenge. 
Yes, agreed, 100%. Right, so kind of the level four skills that uh, are important uh, for, an for an organization is kind of around governance and what you can really do around Power BI. Now, this doesn't sit anywhere on that pyramid that I had before, but this is something we don't want organizations to forget about. And I know this is near and dear to your heart as well, Mike. Oh, yeah, and totally. Making sure that you understand and appreciate the administration and architecture side of uh, Power BI. And as, as we like to say in this, you know, phrase might have actually come from you or uh, Melissa, Mike, is putting the guardrails around your environment. Yeah. Is, is the governance not saying no? Comes from us. Mm -hmm. put, put the guardrails around things, let people do stuff in a self yes. manner, but give them the safety net so they can kind of bump around. Yes. Things, yes. Which is fine. So, and this becomes more important the more you go, you err on the side of self service. So, um, you know, this, this is, this is really relevant for, you know, the administration side of things. You don't want to be over controlling because then no one can do anything. And then, and then what happens, everyone exports everything to Excel and then everything in Excel happens, right? But you don't want to be so loose that what we talked about earlier, you look over your shoulder over the last work you've done for the last three years and all you have is just a pile of mess and there's no consistent story around anything, right? So um, you have to be able to look across all the reports in your organization and pull from the entire library the most relevant pieces and highlight them. Right. So all data is not created equal. And how do you get that data from a an idea out of Michael's head to something that the the entire department or organization will use? That, that's not an easy task. And it doesn't matter. This is a bit more universal as well. Methodologies and principles around this is not just specifically around Power BI. This is every BI tool. This is not just the technology is is getting better but it's, it's creating a lot more potential headache for organizations. And so this is one of the primary things I'm going to do a little sales pitching here. Um, Melissa Coates, who's an, also a Microsoft MVP, created the course um, Power BI Employment and Governance. And I'd highly recommend checking out our course. Uh, and I'm now helping lead the course as well. So um, if you want to engage with that course, it talks a lot about the administration, the deployment, and the deployment strategies you can use, because depending on what your organization is comfortable with, you may have a very centralized BI team, or you may have a very decentralized BI team. But these patterns that we, we have identified that work very well with organizations really help you identify what is a value add to you long term. I'll throw that in the chat window as, as well, that way people can see uh, the course as well. It's, a, it's an online course you can do self-paced. And then we also do like uh, sessions every month. Uh, live Q&As, workshops, and go really in depth with the material and the content to make sure everyone's understanding and getting a really rich engagement around what it's doing. Yeah, and I'll also give you a little plug on that as well. So our resources and organization that are doing governance work, and there's a lot of it happening right now, mm -hmm. uh, have gone through the courses through Melissa and now yourself, and, and they rave about it uh, in terms of you know, the, the initial base level understanding. And then in particular, uh, the ongoing feedback and uh, question and answer stuff that uh, yep. you guys kind of piggyback alongside of that. I've got some of my Power BI governance people that have continually keep re-enrolling in the class because they just want to stay part of that forum because it's so valuable. And I look at it and say, 600 bucks for that? That's worth it. I think it's around 600 bucks. I can't remember the exact number. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. It's, yeah. it's, it's worth it. I would recommend it. Yes. It, so, is, it is it is very much worth it um, to do the class. And I think, that, and in, in addition to just that you hear us talking about it, you get a whole bunch of handouts and workshops and like there's a lot of materials that you take away back to your organization. So the idea is take this class, take the materials you go back to your, your organization, use it to run your center of excellence, use it to talk to your executive sponsor, use it to build processes in your org that works well with Power BI. Again, the idea is accelerate you faster by learning from experts who've already done it. Yeah, and my my final words on kind of governance here before I move on to the kind of the overview on this is, you know, I'll never forget I had a, a manager many years ago, you know, I would always be saying, no, you can't have that. No, you can't mm. do that. No, you can't do that. So I just said no a lot, right? Yeah. And I'll never forget, they said, if you just continue to say no to people, I don't need you. I can just turn everything off. Uh, your job yeah. is to figure out how to say yes. So that's kind of where this comes in to say, let's figure Very out how good to point. And do it yeah. in a safe manner. I agree. So yeah, it was, uh, that's, that's staying stuck with me for a very long time. So I, I'll, I'm sorry, to, not to belabor your last point here, but I think many organizations are dealing with the other topics here. Level four hasn't quite hit yet. I honestly think, I think, I think level four, I'm having more and more and more really relevant conversations around what does this really mean? So yeah. I think levels one through three are more kind of being initially interest. Level four is yet to come and stay tuned. 
because it's going to be a massive topic. It, there's going to be heads will roll unless you do this right. The the tidal wave is already kind of coming ashore right now on this one, especially for us. And I know we're oh, talking. Yeah. About, you're seeing this as well. Yep. You know, it's that you know, a lot of organizations have let Power BI just kind of go do its thing for years, and yes. you know, looking in the rearview mirror, going, "Uh oh, what happened?" Uh oh, what, yeah. <laughs> we have so many. Like we have so many reports now. What do we do? Like what is actually adding value and what is not? Yeah, yeah. I'd agree with that as well. All right. So kind of tying all this together. So after you kind of bring all these excuse me, skills together, you're going to roughly cover all the boxes like this. And as I kind of like to say is if you've gotten to this level, anything that doesn't have a box around it, you're probably proficient enough just to go find yourself a YouTube video or a blog and go learn about, uh, you know, using the advanced query model to write M uh, more so yeah. than using the UI. So go, go get Paul Raviv's book, right? Gil's got a great power query. Yeah. Go Google it on Amazon. I'll go pull it up here right now for you. So, you know, there's a book on that topic. It's absolutely incredible. And I have a, a handful of them here at my house as well, because I give them away to people because it's just so valuable. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I've got the book up on my bookshelf, but it's don't. Yeah, I saw you look. I thought you looked at the yeah. book. I've got it up there. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so kind of just maybe putting a, a little bit of a wrap around this. So maybe it'll take five minutes just going through these next couple just to talk about, you know, now that we've talked about the roles and kind of the levels, what are some of the other, you know, parts of the onion, for lack of a better term, that kind of, you know, sit around this? And I, I love what you're kind of saying about community of practice uh, earlier, Mike. So maybe kind of just talk yes. a little bit about community of practice. So well, I think every organization already has this to some degree, but they don't necessarily recognize it or understand how to put really terms around this. So community of practice is really anyone who's touching the Power BI tool, right? If, I, if I'm working on something in Power BI and I reach over to Chris and say, hey, I need a little help here. You know, you're part of that community of practice. Everyone's trying to practice and get better. And it's basically all inside the organization. This incorporates everyone, report consumers, report authors, data modelers, uh, you know, the administration of Power BI, right? If it touches that surface area, which is pretty much everyone in the organization at some level, that are part of the, that community of practice. The community of practice has no real deliverables. It just really means a collection of people who are all doing Power BI things together at, at its essence. That's kind of how I like to think of the community of practice. There are subgroups inside the community of practice, which we'll talk here more in a, bit of, a minute about. Yeah, I think the, 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 for, the terms that I like to use around the community of practice is that kind of almost anything nowadays, you know, not just data itself, but if you don't have good collaboration and communication, you're going to have a hard time with anything in technology. And if you can yep. collaborate and communicate well as a community of practice, yes. you're just going to elevate everybody's skills. So center of excellence. Yeah, yeah that's so th this one goes deeper now. So, you know, if you think of like a subset, like if you had like a, a Venn diagram, right? Uh, the smaller bubble, not a Venn diagram, but maybe like a concentric circle diagram, right? A smaller portion of that is now the center of excellence. Now the center of excellence is much more unique in that the center of excellence really pushes the, the training, the knowledge, the deliverable tasks that are then making the community of practice a success, right? This, this part of the organization has real quarterly deliverables. One of your goals may be, I wanna see the usage of Power BI increases. The center of excellence defines what that metric is. I'm talking about unique views on a report, or I'm talking about number of workspaces created, or you know, insert other metric here. The center of, the center of excellence says what they're going to measure, goes out and does things, training, access to the license, build process, and then they come back and report back on that and says, okay, here's what we did. We said we were going to increase our workspace usage by 10%. Here it is. Or we're going to have this other metric of we want a model and thin report in every workspace. So how many reports link to a single model? Is that number going up or going down? Is that as our education, as the training that we're providing back to the organization, is that working? The center of excellence is very key when we talk about that yellow box level four for administration. You know, this is the group that's deciding what that is. Executive sponsors probably don't know what that means. But this team is is focusing on how do we how do we really get our hands around um, governance, what data are what data sets are certified, what's the process to get a certified data set. Uh, another common one is uh, if your organization doesn't let people create their own workspaces, well then how do I request a workspace? What is that process look like? And so defining what those are, and then maybe being able to do like a RASIC essentially on that on that process. Okay, here's the process. Here's the people who need to know about it that really enables back to the organization a value add that that team can then quantify real numbers 
the, the impact of what they're doing. You're really moving the needle forward. Yeah, that's that's a perfect segue into kind of the, the governed environment. And oh, you actually like we talked about these slides before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you actually just got me thinking about a, a metric here. And you know, I, I whenever I teach our Power BI class, I always kind of talk about uh, you know one element of a central version of the truth is not just to go ahead and create it, but sometimes to get rid of things that are not the central version of the truth. And you know, through some of the metrics and telemetry you get out of uh, the Power BI tenant, you can see what is being used and what is not. And we can, in a more, uh, you know, educated manner, turn things down or sunset things that are no longer being, uh, no longer being used. So that that is there. And sometimes that creating the central truth means getting rid of things that are uh, are not the central version of the truth. And uh, you kind of think about a lot of organizations. They'll say, "Hey, we've got like 1,200 reports." But mm -hmm. if you're kind of moving more towards that central truth, you should probably start having a lot fewer reports, uh, potentially, and fewer models, but more people accessing those fewer things, right? So, uh, you know, I just trying to now think about a, a visual around that. How would we start articulating that? Because in a, a sprawled environment, you'd have one model, one report, uh, and maybe two users, then a similar model with two users, another model is kind of similar with two users. Yep, if you get yep. consolidating that, you're going to get fewer models and reports and more users using those things, which is kind of that whole central truth thing. So I got to think about some visuals to put around that. So any more you want to add around the governed environment? I know it's a, your yeah, the, this, this is kind of like my baby right now. Uh, you know, with Melissa and I working and beating up ideas about this all the time. Um, and this, this is an area where it, the governing of things is very increasingly important. And I, I think I'm quickly realizing in the self-service space, not everything's important, right? Every report that's being created by, if you just, if you step back and look at the whole of the organization, right? There's going to be a pile of reports at the bottom of the, of the, of the, of the pile of reporting that you build that are just, nah, they're okay. They maybe serve a very specific use case or a very, um, you know, niche thing. But the, the more you start looking at the, the reports that are really creating impact, the reports that are really adding value are helping you measure the business to make decisions to spend more marketing, hire more people, Right? There's, there's real decisions being made. There are certain areas in the business that if those reports turn off, we now have a problem. And so it's the governing of this really starts looking at, okay, what does Microsoft provide technology-wise and how does that technology integrate with our people and process? And, and that's where, Lee, where I think this, this level it clicks for me. Uh, and you really start focusing on, let's, let's build some certified data sets. Let's define what certified means. Let's make sure we have uh, an SLA around that materials or that data and provide confidence back to the people consuming it, right? So there's, there's a lot more transparency required when you're really doing self-service. Do you have your models well-documented? Are there measures and, and descriptions inside each of those things? Where do you put that? And the number of organizations I walk into, there's great data models, but there's no documentation in them. It's just a big miss. That's, that's not what we should be doing on the most important data sets. We need to know what this stuff is doing. And then along with the idea of governance piece here is, you know, you've got to have that center of excellence working very closely with governance. It's so tightly coupled. The center of excellence is building the documentation, building the training, building the best practices. And we need to be putting that in a common area, like a, a SharePoint or Teams or some location where everyone can go find this information and knowledge themselves. And that really moves the organization forward. It really does try to move things more towards self-service. Yeah, and this is a, another set of visuals that I will probably start working on here in the next little bit is around the notion of self-services, you know, and I've always kind of defined as letting the business do more with a little less IT intervention. And the key word there is less IT intervention. I didn't say no IT intervention because yep. you want collaboration, communication, uh, and the community practice kind of working together. Uh, but there's, you know, at the end of the day, I was, I was sitting with a, a client of ours the other day, and they were still kind of following that we want to warehouse every last little stitch of data in the organization. I said, how on, earth, possible we, how on earth are you ever going to keep up with that? There are more businesses out there than you. You are setting yourself up for absolute failure. Yeah. Uh, let yep. those users do some of the things on their own. Let them take advantage of the power of Power BI in a best practice and educated manner to do their stuff. And if it proves to be of value and Bingo. more people use it, Bingo. Move, move that up the value Let's chain. This is my moniker that I use, act like the business, but think like IT. This is, I use this all the time because the idea is we want to move fast, make prototypes, get value added. That's the business, 100%. When I was in the business, that's all we did. We did not care about dev test prod. We wanted to go. 
right? Let's move fast. But when you start thinking about things from an IT perspective, there are certain pieces of data that are very critical and very important that you cannot have failing on you. So you need a bit more rigor and plan around what those things are. So I'm, I'm always of the opinion, the business should be leading the IT organization. It should not be a detriment to the organization to have business users play with data. However, it's very important to note what data can I trust and what data can I not trust? Because if you have too much self-service without any governance or any level of involvement from that center of excellence team, you now lose the validity of what they're trying to do. So it, it takes real, real effort, real work to make this thing move forward. Yeah, and if you kind of think about the 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 growth and life cycle of most spreadsheets, the most way most Excel spreadsheets worked is some one user would build it. Yep. They add more, kind of the house of cards would get built yep. up because yep. not every user in Excel followed good practices. And it just kind of one person, it just get built up like house of cards essentially. And essentially, then you'd have this one thing that one person knew that was essential to the organization. And what happened now? Tribal knowledge. Away, or they yep. went away on vacation or they left the organization, right? People would be afraid to touch that thing, right? So it yep. you know, happens is a, all the time, way more than you would like to admit. 100%. And the inflection point really now that Power BI, once we get these operating models in place in our organizations is mm -hmm. with the telemetry within the Power BI service, once something hits the criteria that you say as an organization needs to move into a more yes. governing manner. Yep go ahead and pick that up because now the value has been proven mm, and yeah. then you go ahead and warehouse that and certify it and all those different things. Right. So yeah, there's an incredible point I want to point out here around this one. You just, you just said something, you need to monitor it. Yeah. Power BI is very good at making a lot of data, but is not good at monitoring its own data. So I have uh, so part of my company, we have an accelerator that we built for, for companies. We actually have an accelerator around building out uh, a, an automated way to get all of the data and activity usage right out of Power BI. So if your organization is trying to govern things and you don't have some sort of cross company monitoring solution, come talk to me because we've got that. We'd like that, that to do any kind of governance, you have to have data to be able to govern too. Uh, you can't measure, you can't change things you can't measure. So if you're not measuring it to begin with, you're, you're already at a loss. So this, this is, can't be understated here about how important it is for you to have a central solution to get all your data together because that really informs a lot of the actions moving to your next step. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, we've got something very similar built up uh, around the, the, the back end uh, side of Power BI to kind of tell people that uh, yep. information. Oh, yeah, you, 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 you need that information, right? To know when to think, take things from that self-service world into the more governed world, yeah. which, you know, kind of maybe coming to our last slide here is, uh, Kind of just talking about you know the the overarching data culture you know what do you want to kind of say around that mike and data culture is, is everywhere whether you have it whether you like it or not and it's either a good data culture or bad data culture so i mean i mean it, it's it's the same the same moniker of like you know making no decision is making a decision you're deciding not to decide so you, you can't not have a data culture it's either uh you know we all rely on you know Robert over here in this space that that it does everything for us analytically, or everyone does our own thing, right? You're going to have a culture regardless. And so all you're, what you're really doing here is you're actually instilling with people in the organization, getting them to march the same direction. And I can't, and the Microsoft Power BI adoption roadmap has a great section around building out data culture and what data culture looks like. And it actually has gauges to say, are you a level 100 to 500? And here's what it may mean for you to be in these different areas based on your data culture. So I really, this, this, this can't be as underestimated enough. And I think a lot of these other pieces we talked about, right? Engaging with the community practice, center of excellence, producing training and best practices and documenting things, governance on top of it. All these other parts we talked about really lead up to the summation of all those elements. That is the data culture. If you have a strong data culture, you'll have probably robust other pieces of this. Yeah, and I, and I love the fact that, uh, you know, through that uh, kit, you can start measuring some of this stuff, right? Because we, we want to be able to measure our effectiveness and how well things are working as a data culture and what our maturity is so we know what to work on, right? You already kind of said earlier, Mike, uh, you, you, can't, you, know, you can't manage, but you can't measure the old, the old model. Yep. Right? So, no, it's, yeah, exactly. 100% true on that one. And the, fun, the ironic thing about this is, you know, I've, I've been a BI professional for, for a long time is, we we should be good at measuring ourselves, right? Like we're great at going out and telling everyone else is what needs to be done and kind of yes. measuring them. Mm -hmm. 
now we have the ability to start measuring ourselves and we should start taking advantage of this to, to kind of show where people are, where we're at and what needs to be worked on, right? Yes. So it's pr pretty exciting times. I, you know, even though you know, I'm noticing this tidal wave of activity coming in behind us, I'm really excited about the fact that, you know, Power BI is in continuing to evolve, especially, you know, seeing some of the stuff that came out of SQL bits. And, and now organizations are starting to really pay attention to uh, this learning component. How do we up our game at Power BI? How do we put those surrounding uh, pieces in place to actually support their organization through the community practice and build out centers of uh, excellence? And yep. I, I'm really, I can't be more excited right now than, I've never been so excited about, uh, you know, analytics and a central truth and where organizations can go, because I feel more and more wanting to do this. And maybe I'm lucky enough to be working around a lot of fantastic organizations that want to go there. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like as an industry as a whole, as things are are getting getting better. I would agree. I, th I think, and I think the tools are accelerating this conversation more so than ever before, right? The tools themselves are enabling this to be com a, con a conversation that's more prominent now than ever before. Because before it was Excel, like, or I had to go to buy a very expensive tool. Um, and I talk about this in the podcast a lot. The tools that we're talking about here are becoming a commodity. Data is becoming a commodity. Reports are becoming a commodity. It's so easy for people to create things. The, the culture and the promotion of good content is now becoming more important than ever. Yeah, absolutely. So. Really exciting times here. So I'm just going back to the question and answer window, see if there's anything I missed. Uh, anybody want to type any final Q&A questions in uh, before we go ahead and put a wrap on it for today? We had some uh, question here from LinkedIn. Um, it said, a hybrid approach looks like the best approach. Who is managing the demand process centrally, a self-service approach? If an organization has a BI function plus multiple workspaces with workspace admins, who will manage the request from the organization report level? Okay, so this is there's a lot of questions in this topic here, and what I would say here is um, uh, the the idea that um, the organization there's there's multiple places to put management roles here. If you're talking about workspace list things, let's let's start with more workspace level things. If you're talking about a workspace, it's very relevant to have one or two admins, one or two members, and a lot more inside the contributors and viewer area. So first and foremost, you can identify a workspace owner. Those are the people that you go talk to when there's a problem with data sets coming out of their space. So as you're, as you're trying to distribute and delegate these things across the organization, right, that you can uh, enable that team to work in their my workspace, but then you're relinquishing more data control there. Um, a hybrid approach is a best approach, right? So it, the, the make, it makes the most sense. If you think about your organization, the most people in your organization are report consumers, bar none. They're, they don't they don't necessarily model data. They don't build reports. They're just give me the data in a in an app or report. And I'll go consume that. The next largest group you have is that report creator, that persona around report creation, and so that report creator is now someone who then generates um, builds out those individual reports, and then your your tightest circle of that concentric circles is your data modeler. And typically, those are data engineers turned data modelers or uh, Power BI report heavy developers that have been moved into that data engineering space. So they're very much more technical. They seem to be much more that engineering mindset. And so when you're talking about that central uh, hybrid approach, I love to have the, the, the enterprise, the IT side of things, build the data models. Think about what data do we need to access because we want to build those transformation and tables upstream in tools that are way more technical. Then we distill those tables down into models and or data flows that we can then distribute to the organization. And now we let the business build out their MVPs, play with the data, make value. And then at some point, right, the center of excellence comes back into play here and says, okay, what have we been creating? And now what have we done to be able to bring that information into a central governed space? So again, you know, to answer your question, a hybrid model is best, but you have to think about how do you plan to migrate content that's from data that IT provides to where the business builds and then potentially pull some of those business built tools back up into the IT space. And so um, I'd like to think of them more like managed or governed solutions because the governance can be handled by many different teams, but they have to be technical leaders in that management of that piece and communicating very clearly about the service level agreement around that data set, right? When it fails, who do, who do I go talk to, right? There's gotta be someone at the end of the day who has data ownership of that. And that's a lot of that's covered in our class. 
um, for Coach Data Strategies, talking about what is a hybrid approach, how to best utilize that. So um, uh, thank you very much for your comment, but I would, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can resp respond to that one on LinkedIn as well with, with some more information there. Perfect. And I don't see any other questions from my side. No, I don't see any more questions uh, either. So Mike, uh, I have to say that we, we got that one in just a little over an hour. Uh, did better. We did better. This is a, a giant uh, a giant topic, and I'm sure there's going to be more to come, and I'm sure you and I'll have some more sessions like this through the rest of the year as we continue to kind of evolve these uh, practices and organizations start to mature and understand some of the challenges and problems they're having. But uh, endless opportunity right now in this space is kind of the way, way I like to look at it. I would agree with you there 100%. All right, so that's it. That's all. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Uh, Mike, it was a slice. Thank you very much. And have yourself a fantastic rest of your day. It's been a pleasure. It's a great conversation. There's so many good things going on. So uh, stay tuned. More, many more things to come from both of us, probably. Uh, Iteration Insights and uh, you know Power BI Tips as we continue to just keep investing in this whole data space. And Power BI keeps evolving to a much really good purpose. I'm really very pleased with where they're going. Uh, and I will say, if you haven't made data part of your career yet, I have done it, and it has been a very good move for me. So if, if, you, do, if you don't think you're gonna, uh, you need a change in things, I'd highly recommend uh, looking at or investing your time in uh, running and managing data things for your organization, because I think it makes a ton of sense, uh, and there's a lot of value there long-term for your career. Endless opportunity. Endless opportunity. Thank you all. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Mike. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye.